Jacob graduated a couple years ago. He went to LA and then he came back East Coast and he's in Philly right now. And he's looking at grad school for very high scientific stuff for, <laughs> for um, like trying to take film into the next world. Uh, so adding kind of like computer science into everything he learned and so he's also working on a documentary that has a lot of fair use issues and so we thought it would be good to talk about that everything he's learned because you take these classes in entertainment media but then you never like actually know what to do with that information until you're actually making something and then you get into trouble so Jacob's here to tell us what trouble he's gotten into and how he's getting himself out of it, out of it. And uh, you can also talk about uh, fair use for animation or for AI generated art or anything else he has experience with. Jacob. Hi, everybody. Those things are all true. Um, so, yes, I will be talking about uh, fair use and generally kind of intellectual property. And um, I don't know if anybody here has seen my previous presentations I've done. They've been pretty um, like uh, specific as to processes I went through and stuff like that. I, I, I want to open this very much up to questions and comments throughout because the topics of intellectual property and fair use are very um, modular and case by case. And it, it, it's not, um, fair use is a defense um, against property or uh, not property, copyright infringement. So it's something that's evaluated on a case by case basis in courts. So um, it's something that there's always going to be a new question for. And I mean, AI is a good example. That's the, the it's just, it's, it's ever expanding. So my, I'm going I'm to have a PowerPoint, and then after the PowerPoint, I'm going to show a few video examples of fair use provided by a couple sources, one YouTube, and I'm going to focus on YouTube a little bit towards the end, because a lot of people, that's where a lot of their stuff goes, and they want to know what the deal with that is. So, um, yeah, so again, any questions at any point, um, just ask, comments, anything because this is not, I am not a lawyer and uh, I, I, I don't have all the answers and if other people want to weigh in, then they should because this is a complicated uh, topic. So let's, let's get into it. I um, think a few people came because they have something to contribute as well. So feel free to jump in. Yes, yes, yes. And excuse me if, if my cats jump on me while I'm uh, talking, it's possible. Uh, anyways, uh, okay, let me share my screen so we can get into the PowerPoint. Um, okay. Is that working? Yes. You see a PowerPoint right now? Yes. Yeah, it's snazzy. Um, <clears throat> and it just changed slides and stuff? Yeah, you're good. Okay, cool. All right. So the uh, fair use, is this legal theft? Well, might be. But let's start by talking about intellectual property. So intellectual property is intangible creations of human intellect. Those are things as opposed to something like private property that are not divisible. Um, you can't, if I use something that's an intellectual in, in the realm of intellectual property and I use that, I'm not now creating, I'm not taking something that was there and making less of it necessarily. It's kind of unlimited in a sense. So, and there's actually people that criticize the idea of calling it property in the first place and instead want to call it things like intellectual monopolies or all kinds of stuff just because of how um, how complicated the idea of owning ideas and intangible kind of things are. Um, so oh, this will include things like 
patents, copyrights, trademarks, trade secrets, sometimes pl plants even like, uh, like certain kinds of GMOs and seeds and stuff like that, industrial designs, et cetera. Um, the, the main purpose of intellectual property law as it's stipulated or as it's kind of proposed by people that came up with these rules is that it's to encourage the creation of a wide variety of intellectual goods through a market incentive in the sense that if you feel like you have ownership over intellectual creations or intangible kind of uh, products, that supposedly creates a market incentive for you to then make those things because you know that you will benefit from those things as kind of as a as, as a product of your labor. Um, uh, and the idea is to kind of balance these rights so that they're strong enough to encourage the creation of intellectual goods, but they're not so strong they prevent the goods wide use in um, in the sense that you don't want intellectual property laws to have kind of a chilling effect on creation in the sense that you don't want the laws to be so stringent that people end up not doing things and contributing to the public good because they're worried of being sued or having criminal prosecution, et cetera. Um, it actually originated as monopoly rights that were given by the Queen of England or something to industries so they could they could have rights over uh, certain industries. And that's part of the reason some people call it more of a monopoly than a pro uh, property right. Um, so yeah, that this is, I, I'm, I'm gonna talk about things kind of generally. I might not read word for word what I wrote. So um, criticisms of intellectual property. Does it stifle innovation? Well, that's the thing. It, it's kind of a balancing act. So you want to, um, so some people would say that the idea of intellectual property kind of has it 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 it's supposed to have an effect of incentivizing productions but at the same time it kind of creates an artificial scarcity of something it kind of detracts from um the public the, that balancing act between the public good and and kind of individual incentives for creation some people lean heavily on the side that you need to be able to protect those things and other people kind of lean on the side that this is that this is very arbitrary and these intellectual creations are supposed to be for the public good and so protecting them at all sometimes can be seen as a um kind of an infringement on human rights in a way um and there's a there's there's a lot of conflicting information on this i'm not going to get too much into it, but the the I, I wanted to start with this because ultimately um, it's kind of a philosophical issue. It's an economic issue, and it's something that's heavily debated and changes frequently. Um, it's not some and it's something that you want to stay up to date on because this is not a static kind of concept. It's something that uh, it, it 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 changes just it, it, a lot. So. Um, and there's a lot of kind of modularity to it. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, and again, any comments, questions, please let me know. Um, so an ex exceptions to copyright, things that co people commonly will know about are things like public domain, where that's, that's something that either it was created before, be, if, if it was created before 1978, then it was it needed to be copyrighted to have a copyright. After 1978, things actually you don't have to file for a copyright to actually for something to have a copyright. So if something was created before 1978 but was not explicitly copyrighted, it is essentially public domain unless afterwards something took place or it was transformed in such a way that then was a new thing that then was copyrighted. There's a lot of kind of like loopholes to a lot of these things, or the copyright could have also expired, or it was never subject to copyright at all, like work created for the government is an example. And there can still even be a cost to using things that are um, nominally free and public domain. 
for example, if you want to get like the original masters of something, there's still people that can hold on to the original masters of something like the, the original film reel or the original master file or something. And you still might need to buy it from them if you want the full like fidelity original copy of something. And also there's all kinds of weird things like if something is public domain, but a part of it is not public domain, then certain like if something if a film is public, uh, I think example was there was an example of this was a specific film where if a film is public domain, but the the book the film is based on is not public domain, the film can actually be um, said to be not public domain because it relies as a derivation on the book. So then the film actually, even if it is technically public domain, it's not. Be so there, there again, there's like public domain essentially means that there's it, some part of it in some way that is not subject at all to copyright. And it's something, but even in that case, you still want to look into the thing that you're, you're wanting to take from, um, just to make sure that what you're doing is okay. There's actually, Cornell has a list of copyright, um, copyright uh, rules for public domain stuff, like it was created before this date or after this date or stuff like that. So, um, I can provide that actually later when I'll get the link. But then the another thing is fair use. So fair use is it allows the unlicensed usage of copyrighted materials such as text, images, video clips, and audio files without permission from the author or the copyright owner under certain circumstances such as criticism, parody, news reporting, commentary research, educational purposes, et cetera. Um, and it actually, it comes from our first amendment rights. So it comes from the idea of freedom of speech um, and freedom of expression. And that, that's, that's, that, that's kind of one of the, the counterbalances to this idea that um, intellectual property kind of stifles people's abilities to express themselves or creates like a chilling effect so that they don't want to do things because they're afraid of criminal penalties. So fair use comes into play um, like ideologically as a, um, as a continuation of the First Amendment. And similar concepts exist elsewhere in the world. There's fair, uh, fair dealings or something in the UK and France has some French word for their thing. I don't remember what it is. And all kinds of other languages of all kinds of other things. And that's part of it is that, you know, if you're making something in the US and then you're releasing it into other markets, you're gonna have to deal with other kinds of laws. And a lot, I think, I think a lot of the theme of this whole thing is gonna be that you want, you don't want to have unknown unknowns, as they say. You don't want to have things that you don't know you're doing wrong. And you want to at least know that, okay, I'm doing this, like I'm releasing this film to another market in another country or something another film festival in another country, whatever it is that might have different laws, you want to know that, that could be an issue and look into that. Um, it, it's, it's case by case. So you can't know for sure any of these things, but you want to know what you're supposed to look into at the very least. So um, yeah, fair use, fair use is a defense for copyright infringement. Therefore, there is no strict definition for fair use. There are only general guidelines um, fair use is flexible and what and much of what defines it is determined by court decisions, precedents. There's um, I'll get to it later, but uh, the CSMI looked into a lot of court decisions to create a best practices document um, that I go over a little bit. Um, fair use, four key factors. So we got purpose and character. What is the purpose and character of your appropriation of a work? Like what, um, it, 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 so the, the big word of fair use is transformative. It's at the end of the day, a lot of it comes down to trans, transformativeness. So you, in, you want to be in a different form or have a different purpose from the original um, use. If you use a film that was about selling, um, selling, uh, I don't know, like uh, cars or something. And then you make a film that uses footage from that commercial on selling cars about 
materialism in America or something like that, you have transformed the purpose of that original um, thing. That you're not trying to sell cars with that. So that you're you're transforming it. Um, and yeah, you don't want there to be repetition with no added value or that likely will not be fair use. Um, again, it's kind of a gray area, but it's th the best practice is to alter or comment on or draw attention to for another purpose what you're what you're using. Um, and it takes into consideration if the work has a commercial purpose or not, um, which it doesn't always. And then there's the, the nature of the copyright work. It can be harder to justify fair use with highly original creative works as opposed to with fact-based works, works like news footage, quotes from historical records. So if you're, if you're going on, um, for example, like BBC archives to find a news report, you might be more likely to be able to claim fair use than if you um, are taking something straight from a film. You, you still will be able to claim fair use in a lot of cases with that. It's just hard, a little bit, it can be harder to justify. Um, the amount or portion of the work used is another major factor. So when uh, you wanna limit your usage, to the least amount of the work that is possible in order to carry out its purpose. Um, that, that it, it, the, the less, the better. Um, sometimes that's not always possible, but just the least you can. And there's an exception to this where if you use the most famous part of a copyright protected work, it's possible you won't be able to claim fair use, even if it's very short, if you don't have sufficient other reasons for it. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of kind of factors. Uh, the amount is not the most important thing, but it's certainly important. Um, the effect on the market. So will it be harder for the original copyright holder to monetize the work now that it has been copied? Um, so a good way to think about it is like the car thing I said, are you infringing on the market for cars by creating this commentary on consumerism in, in the aforementioned thing? Well, I would argue no. Um, a car manufacturer, I don't know what they're going to argue, but I would, I would say no, and you would probably say no if you were trying to claim fair use. You, you want um, to not be infringing on money that could be made by the original copyright holder as much as possible. Um, and that's where transformativeness will play into that. It, it can be very hard to actually claim that money is being lost hypothetically. So it's like, there's a lot of companies that probably overreach what is, is socially kind of considered a loss. And they'll say, well, if you use this, someone might not have uh, paid for this in this context or something. But at the end of the day, it's determined by a judge, but you, you, your best practice is to try to at least think of like uh, an argument for how this is not in, inflicting damage to the, the market value of the original piece. Um, so yeah, like I was saying, the CSMI, which is the Center for some, Something Media Information, it, whatever it is, um, it's, for, it's for film people. And this, this focused a little bit more on on documentary filmmakers, their guidelines. So they kind of aggregated a lot of data, did kind of little meta analysis of all these court cases and what was qualifying as fair use. And I should note that fair use actually is, it, it's actually trended towards being more liberal. I think 63% of fair use claims were, were um, accepted. So that's, you know, it's something that is not you're not you're taking a risk in some regards, but you're not totally like up against a, a you know a behemoth and trying to tackle this this claim. So after yeah, after reviewing uh, rulings on fair use, that the it, it they determined that the decisions largely largely depended on transformativeness and the amount of material used. So. This is where they get into some, I'll get into some examples that 
this pertains a lot to um, filmmaking. I'm not, I mean, I'm not sure the extent to which a lot of people are curious about this as it relates to things other than um, filmmaking or kind of visual media, but that's something that please ask about um, because that's just as relevant. So some examples are if the, if the film is, um, or if it's being used, if the copyright material is being used as an object of social, political, cultural, or media critique. So like the example I said, taking a car commercial, using it as a critique of consumerism, that would be a social, politi social, political, cultural critique, or like a film review or reaction videos, um, like you see on YouTube, those are like media critiques that critique the specific media as um, as as the contents of it uh, for for slightly different purposes, whatever. Um, also, incidentally, capturing content in the process of filming something else. If you're making kind of if you're making a documentary that is supposed to have an element of realism, is supposed to capture real life, then um, you know, it, uh, it, common sense would say that you're going to capture some things that are trademarked or copyright material. So if you're walking around with a camera in New York City and you're making a documentary and you're in Times Square and you capture a trademarked image on a, on a screen or whatever, you can claim fair use for that because not doing so would inhibit your ability to make this kind of film. Um, and again, that goes back to kind of freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom of criticism. Um, it would inhibit your ability to express yourself through this medium. So that's also an element of fair use. Um, this, this is actually, so in my film, um, I'm going to be kind of relying a bit more on this third thing, which is quoted copyright, copyrighted works of popular culture to illustrate an argument or a point even if you're not critiquing the work specifically, you might still be able to claim fair use if you're using that work to illustrate an argument you're making. So even if you, so the way this differs is that instead of taking a movie and doing a critique of that movie or taking um, a, a video and using that specific video and commenting on that video in some way, you're, you're quoting something in, in service of a greater point you're making, it's 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 kind of a not a clear distinction. But for example, you might aggregate a lot of footage of um, a lot of footage of fictional films that depict this was so. This is an example they use um, the, the CSMI uses that there, uh, you might take a lot of fictional films from the 20th century that depict in some way race, relation, race relations in America, and your, um, your film might have a point about race relations in America. And so you are showing a lot of these clips or quotes from these previous copyrighted works in service of your point, which is about racial dynamics in America. There's actually, so I've, I have a couple of examples of this and I could, Shana, do you think I should show stuff now or wait till the end to show stuff? I'd have to exit the PowerPoint. I mean, if it, <clears throat> if it's, it's topical. Documentary. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. I will, uh, uh, no. <laughs> okay. uh, oh, wait, got to plug my computer. Hold on a second here. <laughs> don't lose, don't lose power. Yeah, we don't want to do that. Okay, so I got some stuff here. Get out of here. So, uh, where is it? Oh, stupid ads. Okay. So this is an example of fair use. Let's. Okay. So is this? Is there a sound? You, you might just be sharing PowerPoint right now. I don't know that you're sharing your full oh, screen. Oh, 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 okay. Yeah, I, I know why. Yep. Um, uh, Safari, okay. Is that working now? Yep. 
Okay, so this is an example of using fiction films in service of a greater point in a kind of documentary style. And this is, yeah, the Center for Media and Social Impact. They, if you want to see a lot of examples, they posted some, this is, this is one of them. Um, so let's take a look. Let me know if it's not working. What the poems does for to portray all Arabs as subhuman and to portray Islam as a faith of violence. Because in almost every one of these films, when a Muslim would pray, the prayers would be followed by violence. So what Hollywood has done is it's focused primarily on the lunatic fringe. Yeah, so she invoked fair use because she was quoting material in a different context and for a different purpose than for which it was already created. Um, they were making a commentary on how is Islam is represented in American films. So they used films to uh, support that message and they invoked fair use successfully, I imagine. Um, did that video play fine? Yeah. Okay, cool. Here's another one like I was talking about, which takes ads um, and then uses those ads in a video for the purpose of uh, uh, cultural critique. America had more, by 1987, America had more shopping malls than high schools. Few mall shoppers come with any intention of purchasing a particular product, most buy largely on impulse. Oh, party snacks. As this old sales training film suggests, that's no accident. And here's that most important store decision of all, the impulse purchase. To make people hungry for as many things as possible. Hungry enough to buy a lot more than they plan to. Buy the half price dress. The cocktail party will come. Have you been to Potomac Mills this month? It was an ingratiatingly clever ad campaign that first lured me to Potomac Mills Mall. Shopping is therapy. Listen to that little voice in your head. Shop, 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 shop. You can buy happiness. Just don't pay retail for it. Even wholesale, the price is higher than most of us seem able to afford. Yeah, so you get the message. They, they, they were making a uh, cultural critique using these ads. And then also we have, um, so... Another, another purpose for fair use is a uh, historical sequence. Um, and what you want to argue is that you couldn't otherwise have proved this point without using these kind of historical um, images and that it would be unreasonable to assume within the budget of your film that you would get rights to all of these historical uh, documents. So uh, the night before Andy and like I were working on a new climax because we thought, now I have a dream part. I was tired. We had heard it 25 or 30 times. Freedom and justice, I have a dream. But Martin Luther King knew far better than we did. My poor little children. He read the moment. One day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream to make. I was sitting in back of him on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Okay, get the point. And then this is actually provided by YouTube. Um, and I'll get into YouTube in a second as an example of, and this, this is where you get into kind of remixes and kind of using something in a transformative way that isn't even necessarily a, um, well, it is, it is providing a different kind of message, but it's a very more, it, it's much more like uh, with this kind of collage remix mindset. So uh, we won't play the whole thing, but you'll see that they kind of remixed um, uh, the, the Donald Duck thing. So here, take a little look at this. <laughs> Do you feel like you're working harder and harder these days just to stay financially afloat while fat cats get richer and richer? It's not just a feeling, and you're not alone. 
The income gap between rich and poor in America is at an 80-year high. That's the largest differential since the period immediately preceding the Great Depression. The haves are getting more, while the have-nots are getting less. Meanwhile, government isn't helping decades of rising inequality. In peace and friendship and worship God and make things better together. Well, the ideas that built America are being lost and perverted. Ask yourself this one question. How many Marxist, communist, anti-capitalist do you have around you on a daily basis? One, two, three, show. The truth is that you are the defender of liberty. Yes, yeah. Our sit- Okay, so you can clearly see how that is is creating a new message. Um, I don't know if the uh, if Disney was was willing to be that um, topical in their content at the time. Um, so let's go back to PowerPoint. Okay. Yeah, so those are some examples. Now let's talk about YouTube a little bit. Um, first, any questions, comments, anything? Nope, okay. So YouTube um, ha- is not a court. It is not, um, YouTube will not determine what is fair use or not, but we'll, what will happen is you'll, you'll put something on YouTube and then a lot of uh, companies will have a content ID system where they will, um, it's created by YouTube or whatever, they use it and it will identify if their work is um, being used. And if they, um, if they, if it catches something, which it does a lot, especially music, um, then they can submit a copyright claim to have your video either taken down completely um demonetized so the the revenue goes to them or um they can do nothing and just kind of monitor the video i guess so those are the things that youtube can um that they can or they can do on youtube but what will end up happening is at that point you have you're able to um to say that you want to dispute that or not and if you have a claim for fair use, you would dispute that, and then you would argue your claim. It would go to the people who filed the claim, and they would kind of have to decide, is this, is this really a legal fight that is worth having? Um, is this a, a serious claim? YouTube will look at it. And what ends up happening a lot of time is that a lot of people get copyright claims and that's just kind of how YouTube works a little bit. If you if you do things like um, reviews or reaction videos or any other kind of fair use kind of stuff, that's kind of just uh, part of the game. And a lot of it is knowing before you put it on there what um, qualifies as fair use and your argument for fair use in said case and doing as much as you can to avoid copyright claims. And that could be using the least amount of um, footage you can from the source or um, ma- yeah, just making it as obvious as possible following the guidelines I laid out earlier, um, attributing the work and credits, uh, just, yeah, just, you're just trying to follow those guidelines in a way that you know you can argue for in a lot of cases it will be fine um and a lot of times companies don't want to give themselves the negative publicity of doing this huge campaign to remove your little video it it just doesn't make them look good so there's a lot of it's like you're you're assuming a level of risk but you just want to be able to back that up the best you can and anybody who looks at YouTube, you know, there's a lot of movie reviews, a lot of things that use copyright footage, and even things that get claimed and lose don't always get taken down, they just get demonetized. So you, you, it's not something to 
if, you, if you've done your homework and you have a good argument and this is kind of the, the best way you can move forward with your budget and stuff, you, you, you're, you're, you're doing the best you can and that's all you can really do. Um, it, it should be noted that um, fair use doesn't come with like a $0 price tag. I mean, there's times where if you're really ultimately, if you're making anything that that has a that's controversial in that sense of fair use, you would want to consult with a lawyer. But I mean, you can't realistically, you're not going to always do that. So at the very least, um, before you get to the step where you're being sued or you, you need to consult with a lawyer, just internally do the best you can to um, to defend what you're doing. And it, a lot of time it won't even get to that um, because it, it needs to go through quite a few processes and quite a few uh, eggs need to be broken for people to get angry enough to sue you. So it's not like you always need a lawyer, but in some cases you'll, you'll if you can consult with a lawyer, um, there's also kind of, if a production company takes on a project you have, they might want you to have gone over um, er errors and omissions of the, the project with a lawyer so that you can defend to them, okay, I, I have legal representation and I have looked at all these possible problems and blah, blah, blah. So a lot of the time, um, it's it's just, uh, it's it's, a little bit of the wild west, um, but you just want to do the best you can with that. AI is a new uh, phenomenon that is talked about a lot as far as kind of appropriation works. Um, my personal feeling is that in a lot of cases, um, the, that it does qualify as fair use, or it isn't really even a matter. And th this is not my opinion. This is actually how it's been decided as far as like deep fakes goes, is that um, like deep fakes are considered parody in a lot of ways. And even if they're malicious, they actually don't necessarily fall under copyright. So it'll, it'll end up, you can, you can be sued, but a lot of time it'll be for defamation or, um, something like, like along those lines, like, uh, like it, it, it'll in like a civil suit. Um, it's, it's not, it's not, it, it, as of right now, copyright does not have a great grasp on AI um, as it exists. There, there's things in court, precedence will be set. This is why I say things are changing all the time. Um, so it's, it's not set in stone, but things like, you see these image gen, gen, generators, which are kind of the novelty new AI items that everyone talks about. These things appropriate, um, a lot of work in their training model, but one what comes out, as long as it's not, I mean, it, it as far as I'm concerned, it should be judged on the the product of it because otherwise you're eschewing the idea of transformativeness. Because if you take something as a uh, the the or, or origin of your work, and by the end of it, it looks nothing like that. In a sense, you you have transformed it, and the process in between is kind of irrelevant as far as fair use is concerned. Um, it's, it's a complicated issue though. And it's something, there's gonna be a lot of precedents that are probably gonna be set soon. And um, yeah, so that's, it's hard to comment on that at the moment. Um, specific agreements you'll get from websites. A lot of times like if you use, like I use Turbo Squid a lot to get CG stuff, they'll have their own agreements. Sometimes it'll say, um, you can use this for pretty much anything. Sometimes it'll say editorial uses like education. And th those are usually things that um, come with like a brand logo or they're designed in reference to like if you make a CG model of a Ford car, that is um, still under kind of Ford's jurisdiction way. So stuff like that. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, anybody, but stuff like that can still be um, you can still be, you still have limitations on what you can do with it. Um, but, you know, it, it I mean, it kind of depends because I used in a film, I made a chair that was technically modeled off of a chair from a catalog from a company in Europe or something that said for editorial uses, and I used it in my film, 
that I guess was kind of a commercial product. It's not like I made much money off of it, but it's a, I guess, supposedly a commercial product. So, you know, you also have to think common sense, like, is, is this going to be an issue? Uh, no. So uh, even though at the time I, I wrote an email to the company asking them if I could do that, which actually probably could have created more problems than if I hadn't done that. So yeah, you, it's, it's gray. It's a gray area. Um, so yeah, that is the end of the PowerPoint presentation. Um, let me stop the, how do I stop the sharing? How, how do I make the sharing stop? It's make it stop. How do you do it? It should be oh, your stop. Zoom. Oh, there it is. Yeah, there you go. There. You go. I why well, I forget to use Zoom every time. We, okay, forget how to use it. Okay, so um, any questions, comments, things you want elaborated on more? Miles is raising their hand. Hello. Hello. Um, I have two questions. Um, my first one, I'm wondering, you know, in film projects, and I guess just in projects in general. Where does the liability fall when it comes to copyright infringement? Say, you know, an editor uses, you know, copyrighted material. Is the editor liable? Is the production company? Is the director? You know, where does that chain of command kind of fall for liability? That is a great question. And I'd imagine that if you do something under the um, domain of a production company or some kind of LLC, then it will be the production company or LLC. Um and if you're doing it yourself, and you, there, so let's say it's you and your friend, and your friend's the editor, and you're the director. I get. I I don't know. I would assume both, but I don't know. Does anybody know? Well, if you if you're in violation of an agreement that you went into with that company and using that, I think then you could be liable. But otherwise, if you're under, you know you're operating on a normal policy and it runs afoul then yeah i would imagine that the the company the production company whoever's the uh, llc at the top um would probably be the one liable yeah and if you are doing work for a production company and you're a freelancer it's still up to that company to get the rights and everything so you as the artist would say, hey, I am going to use this. Here's how to get the rights for it. So it's not up to you as a freelance artist working for some production LLC company to do that. But you have Wonderful. to tell them you're doing oh, it. Great. Awesome. Yeah, I, Thank you. I, I would assume I'm, I'm not working for a production company in this film I'm making. So I would assume it's just me considering I'm the only person working on it as of now, but. This is why you need an LLC. It protects you and your money. Um, you. yep. Someone tell me how to do that sometime. <laughs> Google, Google will tell you how to okay. do it quickly. Slap my okay. company on it and there you're protected. Yay. Awesome, thank you guys. Uh, my second question I was wondering, I was wondering if you could expand a little bit more on you know, I, when I think of these examples of the internet, you know, copyright infringement, I think a lot about video essays and people who use, you know, do commentary on films and stuff. And I'm wondering if you could elaborate on how monetiza monetization of those videos comes into play with copyright. You know, if they don't monetize it, are they all good to go? I see them like do it all the time where they're, I feel like this is copyright infringement, but, you know, then they monetize and sometimes they get away with it. I don't know where the, how that gets impacted with money. Um, yeah, so that's essentially what I'm doing is it's similar to a video essay, um, where it's going to be a lot of narration and a lot of clips that I don't own the rights to, or some, some things maybe I can get that have creative commons or something, but, um, whatever it is, uh, yeah. So if you monetize that, if you, if you put it on YouTube at all, are you are, if you're mainly talking about YouTube, if you put it on YouTube at all, you're subject to a copyright claim and they can say, like I said, there's, there's, they can say one of three things in, in their claim. They can say they want it down completely. They want the monetization or they want to do nothing and they just want to have the claim. Um, and I think that whether you monetize it or not, I, I part of the copyright law, actually, you, you it doesn't it's not necessary that it's a commercial product or that you are monetizing it for it to be an infringement. So it actually, either way, um, 
can be an infringement. It might be more aggressive if you if you monetize it. Um, but uh, it, it a lot of it depends on uh, how likely it is that this going to happen. Um, and so it's it's hard to say. It, it it really depends kind of I don't know if you're a big creator or a small creator if who, what the company is that is um, DMCAing you. And DMCA is the digital media something something. It it's it DMCA is um that's like a, another subsection of copyright law that's used for like digital products and that's what YouTube uses and a lot of websites um but yeah I think that uh it largely is dependent on the situation yeah digital okay I was totally wrong digital millennium copyright act thanks thanks Brad um yeah and it depends it depends on all the factors I said before and YouTube has internal measures for reviewing these things um it's, it's just it's just very case by case I looked into this a lot as to like how people get away with things on YouTube and the um did I see something that was false Shana no it's just our entertainment lawyer professor said there's no time limit so whatever Eric just said it, um, it, it's a factor but it's not a definitive measure um there's no like six seconds like that's not a thing it's relative to the actual length of the thing you take from generally I mean, and Jacob touched on it too, that if it's a definitive portion, like something that's like a hallmark portion, that can also be argued by the copyright holder as um, damaging, I guess, more damaging to the, the secondary use of it. Um, yeah, so the many factors and it's gray area always. Yes, so um, really depends on the film is to, an to answer the question and the company and everything else. Um, but yeah, monet monetization or not monetization is not the like uh, that's not the the breaking point. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. I also think video essayists would argue that it is transformative because you're not watching the film for the enjoyment of the film, but for the analysis of whatever the essay is about. I will also say some of those people are sponsored to do it, so they're getting paid for it. Yeah, and that's that when they start making arguments about like um, market impact and stuff, and and I would say that monetization in the fact that the person who's using the copyright material is making money would be an argument against them, possibly. So I think I'd, it certainly plays a factor. Yeah, a lot of these things are factors, but it's not. Um, there's nothing that is going to be totally definitive. Um, it's just like even the time thing it might help your case um it is a factor like legally in the in the in the copyright act that where it was proposed that the how how long something is is kind of a factor but it's it's just not going to be like it's under five seconds you're good it's not, yeah it's not going to work like that i thought your example of the chair you used was fascinating because it's like this double layer transformative work and you even said that you might have complicated the issue by contacting the company who made the original chair to begin with so it wouldn't even cross their radar and you're like presenting them with this kind of bizarre situation in which their chair has been modeled by a third party cg artist and then used in your film as another layer of transformation so yeah it can get complicated it, it's it's extremely um, complicated and modular, which is why every the, the answer to everything is largely that it's kind of gray area. But yeah, I I, I don't know the answer to that. But part of the answer is that nothing happens, so it's fine. <laughs> like, so you know, they could have a case if in your film you showed like the chair failing in some way or being shoddy, and it was an, a recognizable product. No, I mean seriously, yeah, I mean they could yeah. make a legal argument. Yeah, no, they they that definitely is possible, and um, you're you're always liable to some degree, whatever you do. But yeah, that makes sense. Rowan, did you want to talk about your experience, or did you have a question or anything? I actually had a question. Um, oh. Yeah, I was about YouTube because I posted something that I worked on on YouTube to share with like family mostly, um, 
and it was all legally like all the all the footage and all the images were legally obtained so they were paid for that we have like contracts and stuff but youtube doesn't know that so how do you let youtube know so that it like doesn't get taken down and your family's trying to watch it and they're like we can't see it um because it is all legally obtained you know yeah so in, in the, I, I've had that specific kind of thing where I made a music video and used a song in the music video that I myself made, but the song was um, distributed under DistroKid, which is like a independent dis distributing thing that actually like put the song on Spotify. So I actually got a copyright claim on the video from my song because it was the, the song was whatever it was, per, the, the copyright was from DistroKid or whatever. And in that case, what ends up happening is that, and this goes back to what I said before, a copyright claim in and of itself is not anything just, just by itself on YouTube. It's just somebody saying something like it's, it's like, it, it's like somebody making a comment on your video. Like, I don't like this. And then something kind of has to happen from that for there to be uh, any kind of issue. So in that, in that situation, um, if the, if the people that held the copyright so, and that gets into comp sometimes people that actually find the copyright infringements aren't even the copyright holders. They're like a third party that, that scours the internet for copyright issues. And so, I, I guess in that instance, what you would want is whoever is claiming the copyright issue to be aware that you didn't infringe so that there might be a claim. However, that claim can be kind of like null, like it, it's just a claim and it, it, it's just like an automatic part of their system. Like some places it's literally just an automatic thing that it claims that it's not even a person doing it. But as long as nothing happens further with that claim, then I believe you're fine. So what, what you want in that case is whoever, whoever's making the claim to be aware that you do have the rights to do that. And then in that case, their claim will be meaningless. That, that's my response to that. But again, cons consult somebody who's a lawyer or something. You have really specific issues. We had, we had a situation um, where we switched vendors for licensed uh, music and sound design. Um, we were using Epidemic Sound, now we're using Megatrax. And so um, uh, tracks under Epidemic Sound that were already on YouTube at, during when we had active contract with them using their sounds were flagged for copyright infringement. And I believe that Epidemic was just contacted directly showing that those works were uploaded while the contract was active and then those issues resolved. So contacting the claimant, whoever is making the claim is usually I think the standard course of action. Yeah, and you can do that directly through YouTube through like if, if they claim it, you can just dispute it and then say that. And then that will actually go to the person who made the claim in the first place. So that that's that's a remedy that a lot of people uh, use, and you can claim fair use that same way. Cool. Anyone else have experience or specific questions? Miles. Sorry to come back in. Uh, I actually have a question for Brad. Um, you just mentioned epidemic and it's funny. I actually was looking at epidemic yesterday because I'm looking between epidemic and artlist.io um, yeah. and, you know, a couple other ones. And I'm, I'm curious your thoughts on uh, risks, you know, that come with it. Are these completely safe? I've been, I was looking through their legal terms actually yesterday, and I just want to make sure before I dump a lot of money into you yeah, know, no, absolutely. this yeah, kind no, of subscription, sure. yeah. um, you know, if I get these files, I've been reading, you know, as like you were saying, like, as long as I upload it in the time I'm paying yep. for the subscription, but, exactly. you know, is there any other things that you have run into before I do this? So, um, well, with our current library, Megatracks, which, I mean, if you haven't checked them out, I highly recommend it. Epidemic, like, hit us up and it's an incredible increase in cost and we just couldn't swing it. I mean, it's a great service. I, awesome to use, but uh, Megatracks came in significantly lower and is a great service as well. So check them out. Um, but uh, yeah, so with Megatracks currently, they had basically a, 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 an artist that was contributing to their library and it contributed something like, you know, two, 300 tracks or something and it's ended their contract with them. And so basically they updated their terms and contacted us and said, 
if you had, again, made these works public in any way, so essentially initiated copyright by distributing the works in any fashion, that could be putting it to your website or putting it on Facebook or, or YouTube or whatever, it goes out there um, and it's public, then that, as long as it's within the terms of when that contract was active, then you're fine. Once you're outside of that, then it's a problem. So it does become a problem with these services if you download tracks with the intention of using them in a work that you're not yet publishing. And let's say your contract expires and then you publish the work a month later. Yeah, then you're liable. So um, basically, as long as you still have active rights to the stuff when it is initially the copyrighted work is published, you should be fine read the fine print, but yeah, it's, it's, it's been okay for us for the most part. Wonderful. I'll check that website out. Thank you for the recommendation. Absolutely. It's a T-R-A-X mega tracks. Yeah. I will add, um, and excuse me for the sick voice. Um, I used epidemic for my production company and I used epidemic for a, um, a basketball players like social media thing and he liked the track so much and wanted it in everything so we went to go license it and before that happened the company then put that track with the end logo in the credits of a televised show um and no one has no one has said anything about it yet but um we paid for the license but some of the licenses with epidemic in particular are exclusive to very specific uses even if you pay the highest amount you then have to contact them and talk specifically about what you're using it for no we haven't done that because no one said anything but that's that's a really good point nick because in our, our negotiations with megatrax essentially they blanket you know authorized use for any works that a student can make and distribute until that was one of the six major like international film festivals or uh, worldwide distribution in some way, like through a major platform. So there were, there were stipulations as to how the, the limits to how this could be used. And the caveat was, as soon as that becomes an issue, you contact us and then we work out individual licensing terms for the track that you're using in those platforms. It's the same thing for um archival footage um from like getty images and other video sites like that too there's like levels um while we're talking about archival stuff and other sources rowan do you have that site that tim told us about yes it's... you want to briefly talk about that and then we'll kind of yeah. wrap up let me find it. I think it's called Critical Pass. So um, when we went to Italy, we met with the director was like telling us stuff about what sites they use to purchase footage, um, archival footage, and he gave me the criticalpass.com. So they take the um, stuff from the Library of Congress and they shorten it down to like four minutes. So it's very more specific for what you need instead of purchasing like a hundred minutes worth of footage. Um, and they have a lot of stuff up there on there. Um, it depends on the topic I was doing. I did a documentary about Algeria and there's a lot of good, there's some good content, but it wasn't like what we were exactly looking for, but we did use a lot of it. Um, and so it's a really good website to use. Here It's called Critical Path. Let me just find it, I can share it, but it's, pretty like it's like 180 dollars and i got like two minutes worth of footage so that's it but it has like everything from the library of congress so it's all pretty good so if you're looking to save some money <laughs> it's a really good uh site um, Actually, the question about that like using like just like footage copyrighted footage in film festivals because brad you mentioned that and um like I'm hoping to submit this film to film festival. So when we had that meeting last year, last year with um Chris and I forgot who else did it about film festivals and copyrighted footage, how does that like work? I guess how do you go about that? I looked into that a little bit uh, as well, and it seems like 
um, it, it's kind of vague and dependent on the film festival you submit to. It, it's, it, it, it's really hard to say bigger film festivals might be pay more attention to things like that and expect you to have like a defense ready or something. Smaller ones might not care. Other ones might not notice at all. Um, it, I, in, from what I read, it depends a lot because I'm looking to do the same thing where I'm looking to submit film festivals um, with, with what I'm doing. And yeah, I, I'm not 100% sure. It might be kind of case by case. I don't know. I mean, historical clips and using it in a generally non-commercial sense um, in some sort of transformative media. So if that's a documentary or other sort of commentary piece uh, that's different from the intent of the original media, um, I think you'd probably be fine in most cases. Um, but as Jacob mentioned, yeah, the, the larger film festivals certainly have more scrutiny and a legal team that's looking at submissions and thing that's, things that they're intending on screening before they run into that liability themselves. So, um, you know, you'd have a greater chance of, of getting contact from legal on a big film festival. Thank you for letting me know. Oh, I, I forgot to mention also that with um, DMCA, there's actually a stipulation that taking things from like DVDs or streaming websites is actually a violation, but the usage of them under fair use might not be. So there was actually something, there, there was an addendum made for like filmmakers where they could actually violate that aspect of DMCA for a while, but I don't, I, that was active until 2021. I don't know if it was renewed. That's something to look into as well. There's also a lot of other kinds of agreements and especially with software with the, um, Brad, you probably know about this. The, 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 the software guy who made the new kind of licensing agreement that like allows you to do, you can, you have, it's like a certain kind of copyright where nobody can monetize the thing you're doing. Um, the GNU license? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. There, there's all kinds of, a lot of that is more on the producer side where you make something and then you copyright or whatever. But there's there's a lot of organizations and different kinds of um, different kinds of rules um, that can help you. There's I think you know YouTube actually has a legal fund for fair use defense that I mean I don't know who they're going to give that to, but that that's a resource for you maybe probably not but might be. Um, yeah, there's, 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 a, there's a lot of cases, a lot of, a lot of different questions that arise. And DMCA actually introduced a lot of vagueness and gray area into a lot of copyright too. So it's not, it's, <laughs> it's basically a, like a, a new platforms. It is like the wild west where these, you know, various transformative media. And if you're a big market player, you have more kind of say and uh, things, but I, I like that you pointed to the, uh, the 60% or over 60%, you know, ruling in, in favor of the fair use argument is, you know, it should make you feel relatively comfortable about uh, using works transformatively uh, and arguing fair use. Just, just think about how you're using them, where you're grabbing them from. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's encouraging. There, there's, a, there's a lot working for you. And it's just, um, yeah, it's, uh, you, you, if you do your homework, you have a good shot, I think. It's just that these things at the end of the day, part of the criticism is they benefit the people who have the resources, the money, the market power to dictate really at the end of the day, what is and is not allowed. If, if a corporation comes at you with their team of lawyers and you're an independent filmmaker, the, they have a lot of leverage. And um, that's part of the criticism is that these kind of, it's it's who who is this stuff benefiting at the end of the day? And uh you know it's 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 it can be controversial so um honestly like uh there's a lot of people advocating for better protection for artists and that is a good thing to look into look into that uh i don't know join their organization or something all kinds of stuff um yes shana ready <laughs> 
Sorry, Sorry that was track. Yeah. The response to a private message. Shouldn't have made that public like that. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, okay. do it. <laughs> um, okay. Are there any other questions, comments, um, anything I didn't cover that someone wishes someone would talk about? Oh, there's a, uh, Shana, you actually mentioned this. Can you like use like a person and like animate them or like take them and like, in like uh, Photoshop, use like the puppet warp and like move them around or something. That similar to deep fakes, um, my understanding is that gets into defamation because nobody has a, if you're parodying something, then that that is allowed um, under copyright, but it's when you get into defamation that you have an issue and that's a whole nother thing that, and anybody can see you for anything. So, you know, it's, <laughs> Yeah, get used to it yeah it's a but, litigious world man yeah yeah but you know feel good with that statistic like brad pointed out i think that that's encouraging and there's a lot of resources for you to learn more so. any other questions no it's been great jacob thank you and all the more reason to form an llc if you want to do anything commercial um yeah great idea to insulate yourself just a little bit with an llc it'll take you 30 minutes and uh be the best thing you ever did it will not yeah it's a well i mean initiate <laughs> to initiate the process but yeah you gotta run a newspaper ad I yeah know. There, there, there are things involved so i had a whole you, team doing it for me of you, two people you, you can find out the steps easily with a simple search and it's it doesn't take you that long okay we I'll did it for our soap business back in fort lauderdale it's it fun you had a soap Everything. business yeah, yeah homemade soap oh damn was it was it goat milk hey what's the company called it's called habitat soap collective it's cool yeah it's a good great time great time can i still buy your products no no definitely not <laughs> that's defunct long defunct can I appropriate your um, your market share? From um, yeah, absolutely, for sure. And you can even like uh, if you take the logo and stuff, you can make a transformative change, and I'm sure it's fine. All right, I will take your word for that and uh, sue you. <laughs> I do. No one, yeah, no Eric, one laugh nice at Eric. No, it was good. I give him the dumb. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank so you, what? Jacob. <laughs> You're welcome. Great, thanks.